Welcome back to another episode of Murder, Mysteries, and More. My name is Kaylee. And my name is Desi. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell next to the subscribe button to turn on post notifications. Before we get into this case, we always encourage those who have useful information to any unsolved case, please report it to your local police and sheriff's department. For your discretion advised, this video will contain some very graphic details. If you cannot handle this or are under the age of 18, click off now. Welcome to part three, <clears throat> where we will jump into exactly who Jack the Ripper is. Jack the Ripper's name did not appear until after the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes on September 30th, 1888. <coughs> Originally, the killer was called Redfin, the Whitechapel murder in the leathern apron. September 27th, a, a letter addressed to the Boss Central News Office, London, was sent. Here's what the letter says. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work, the last job was. I have gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will still hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope, haha. -ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officer, just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. So my knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. At he first, said, I'm down on horse. Oh my god. <laughs> At first, the police were very skeptical of this letter. They thought that this was just a silly prank. But after the gruesome murders of Catherine Eddowes and Elizabeth Stride, officers decide to take a closer look into Jack the Ripper. The part of the letter clipped the lady's ears off and sent to the police officers and then finding Edo's body with her ears clipped off shook the police. It's like he knew what would happen. No shit, bitch. No. <laughs> okay, suspect number one, Montagu John Druitt, 1857 to 1888. British Police Commissioner Melville Magnatton favored Druitt as a suspect. Druitt worked as a bar barista at law and a school assistant in Blackheath, Southeast London. McNaughton lists three suspects who he thinks are more likely than Thomas Cutbush, and Drew is the top one. Here is a statement from him about Drew. A doctor of about 41 years of age and of fairly good family who disappeared at the time of the Miller's Court murder and whose body was, float was found floating in the Thames on December 31st, estimated seven weeks after said murder. The body was said to have been in the water for a month or more. From private information, I have little doubt but that his own family suspected this man of being the Whitechapel murder. It was also alleged that he was sexually insane. So he was a sex addict? Question mark? I guess so. Uh, I don't think that would drive somebody to... Yeah. I don't know. I could be wrong. Druitt's suicide. In November 1888, Druitt was dismissed for unpublished reasons from the school. December 31st, Druitt's body was found floating in the Thames River in Chiswick. It had been in the river for a while. His brother would testify for him. Witness stated that on December 11th, it had been noted that he had been missing for over a week. The witness says they went to school to make an inquiry to find out he had been dismissed. December 30th, he went to search his belongings at his residence and found a letter later addressed to him. Since Friday, I felt like I was going to be like mother and the best thing for me was to die. His brother states that his own mother became insane last July and that he had no other relatives. His death was ruled as a suicide by drowning. It definitely sounds more suicidal than homicidal. Yeah, definitely. The time of his suicide was awfully close to Mary Kelly's um, death, which 
she was the only victim found in the bedroom. Druitt's family also did believe he could have been the Ripper, but there are holes in this theory. McNaughton did have his age wrong. So Druitt was actually 31 years old at the time of his death, not 41. Druitt does have family members who are doctors, but we know Druitt is not confirmed to be a doctor. He worked in law. It could be very likely that he committed suicide due to him being dismissed from school and not killing. There is also nothing suggesting why Druitt would visit Whitechapel or have any knowledge of the area. Jack the Ripper definitely had to have some knowledge of Whitechapel and because Druitt, we don't know if he had any knowledge or was even there, makes him not seem like a very good suspect. Nah, there's so many holes. So many holes in this. I don't think he did it. I don't think so either. Uh, potential suspect number two, Aaron Kaminsky. Melville McNaughton describes him as a Polish Jewish resident in Whitechapel. Then he states that he had a great hatred of women, especially of the prostitute class, and had strong homicidal tendencies. He was removed to a lunatic asylum about March 1889. If you recall, the, the five victims were all prostitutes. Aaron Kaminsky was a Polish-born immigrant, and his father, Abraham Joseph Kosminski, was a tailor. Later on, Aaron's brother, Isaac, became a tailor as well. Kaminsky is to believe to have arrived in London in 1881 and medical records state he was a barber. Assistant Metropolitan Police Commissioner in 1910 wrote in one of his memoirs, I will merely add that the only person who had ever had a good view of the murder unhesitantly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to give evidence against him. In saying that he was a Polish Jew, I am merely stating a definitely ascertained fact. Even though he does not mention the name of the suspect, it was clear that they were referring to Kaminsky. He's being a racist. <laughs> Crime. Yeah, he's being a racist against him because he was a Polish Jew. Like, come on. Um crime record he i mean he did have a crime record in december 1889 kaminsky was caught with an unmuzzled dog in a public park he made his court appearance on december 15th 1889 the police constable bore asked his name gave the wrong name abraham's instead of his actual last name which was kaminsky to be fair there was a lot of anti-sadism and many jews would use alternative last names due to discrimination he was given until monday the next day to pay the fine it's but fine. yeah they definitely sound racist towards him they i mean they were racist against everybody still are July 12th, 1890, Kaminsky was admitted to the Mile End Old Town Workhouse due to mental illness. He was discharged three days later, only to be admitted again in the beginning of 1891. February 7th, 1891, he was declared insane and admitted to Middlesex County Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> Uh, Colony Hatch. However, his insanity was in regards to harming himself and not considered a danger to other people. Jacob Conan of 51 Carter Lane, St. Paul's, this is how he describes Konminsky as. He goes about the streets and picks up bits of bread out of the gutter and eats them. He drinks water from the tap and he refuses food at the hands of others. He took up a knife and threatened the life of his sister. He is very dirty and will not be washed. He has not attempted any kind of work for years. Although he was a minute to the mental asylum, they monitored his behavior many years and they never found homicidal tendencies. So. That definitely makes, like, Jacob Cohan's testimony seem a little bit off. Bro, I'm surprised they didn't give him that man a lobotomy. I mean, he had mental illnesses, and back in the state, they gave people lobotomies. Yeah. So, if that's how he was describing him, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, if that was true, I'm surprised they didn't give the man a lobotomy. Right. But, 
But I mean, they and they watched just... him, and he just didn't have any of the. He was just a little weird, I guess. I don't. I don't think he did it either. No, not as likely. They I just think wanted to more... be racist. Yeah, that's what I would say. They just want to be racist against a Polish Jew, man. Yeah, that poor man. Them racist the hoes. Everybody out here racist. What the fuck? Yeah. Uh, suspect number three is Michael Osterog. Melville McNaughton describes Michael Osterog as a Russian doctor and a convict who was subsequently detained in a lunatic asylum as a homicidal maniac. This man's antecedents were of the worst possible type, and his whereabouts at the time of the murders can never be ascertained. Most of his years he spent incarcerated and would often commit petty theft. However, the only violence on his record was in 1873 when he pulled a revolver on police superintendent Thomas Oswald. And of course he was arrested because who, who does that? Yeah. Many people no. would describe Ostrog as a highly intelligent man that could succeed in almost anything in life. However, he clearly was a criminal for life. He did serve an extremely harsh 10-year sentence, though, for just stealing some books. Like, that's pretty uh? ridiculous. Yeah. Uh. We have people in prison for 10 years stealing books, and then people six months in prison for raping people. Back, so... Because they're white. <laughs> August 28th, 1883, he was released from prison. In 1887, he stole a metal tank guard from the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich. He was committed for trial at the Old Bailey. He did show signs of insanity at his trial. He would be admitted to Surrey Popper... Tooting. <laughs> he was admitted to an asylum. <laughs> Tooting. Um... I'm sure it smelled pretty smelly in that place. There was a lot of tuning. Okay, I'll stop. Okay. I'll stop. And then his <laughs> occupation was declared as a Jewish surgeon. March 5th, 1888, he would be released under one condition. That he report himself regularly. This dude, of course, disappeared because fuck no. He wasn't gonna do that. He was never seen again. During the height of the Ripper killings, Ostrog was one of the names of recent asylum re releases of people who had extensive medical knowledge. April 17th, 1891, he was arrested and declared insane. He was sent to Banstead Lunatic Asylum, and they did declare him as suicidal but not a harm to others. Although he has an extensive criminal record, his medical knowledge, there is a pretty major hole. Our, all, a majority of his crimes were petty theft. He was suicidal and showed no signs of being homicidal. He was also in prison at the time of the murders and never attacked women. So that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, he stole books, but that that's different from slitting people's throats. Yeah, that's a petty crime, bro. I could steal books all day, but I'm not gonna murder somebody. Right, and I think a 10 year sentence for stealing a few books is too That's much. That's wild. Yeah. Come on, Just dude. Just give them a fee or, you know, it's actually good for people to read, so just let them go. Yeah, you should have just let him take them books and fuck it. They probably weren't worth anything anyways. Walter Sicker is suspect number four. Many authors link Sicker to Jack the Ripper murders. Some say he was an accomplice or knew who carried out their horrific crimes. According to crime novelist Patricia Cornwell in her novel, Portrait of a Killer, Jack the Ripper, Case Closed, she declares him as the one responsible. She, unlike other Ripperologists, used mo modern forensic technology to make her case on who she thought was responsible. Ripperologist. According to Cornwall's theory, she says, as a sick, as a child, Sickert was forced to undergo many painful surgeries for the fistula of his dick that made him impotent. R.I.P. <laughs> Unfortunately, this traumatized him emotionally as a kid and made him despise women. However, people pointed out that St. Mark's Hospital, where he supposedly got these procedures, only specializes in rectal and not genital-based procedures. People also point out that he didn't suffer from erectile dysfunction because he had several mistresses. Well, guess what? 
So men have met several mistresses and still have erectile dysfunction, so uh, wrong. Obviously, his wife left him due to him cheating and being a hoe. Many people do not think he was interested in killing women. There is evidence that does suggest he may not have been in London at the time of the murders. Many family members have letters showing that he was visiting France during the height of the murders. Yes, he could have traveled to London. However, there is no evidence proving that he did so. Cornwell was determined to prove him as guilty, though. She claims to have found saliva DNA on the Jack the Ripper letters. There is an issue with that, though. It was mitochondrial DNA, which meant it was shared between 1-10% to 10 of the population, so it was not unique DNA. Um, although it is very possible he wrote the letters, many criminal investigators do not believe the letters to be written by the killer himself. Yeah, I don't- I don't think he did it either. No. Not very likely. And like, just cause you found DNA, does not- shit. Yeah. Cause like, sharing what once is- even 1% of the world population, that's a lot of people. Yeah, no shit, it's a lot of people And though. the range is from 1 to 10%. No, at 4.15 p.m. October 4th, 1888, a man showed up to Mr. Lusk's doorstop at his son's tavern. The man was described as 5'9", 30 to 40 years old, with a bushy brown beard, whiskers, and a mustache. He asked Mr. Lusk to go to a private room with him, which Lusk declined. This is what he says. The stranger's appearance, however, was so repulsive and forbidding that Mr. Lusk declined, but consented to hold a quiet conversation with him in the bar parlor. The two were talking when the stranger drew a pencil from his pocket and purposely dropped it over the side of the table, saying, Pick that up. Just as Mr. Lusk turned to do so, he noticed the stranger make a swift, thorough, silent movement with his right hand towards a, his side pocket and seeing that he was detected assumed nonchalant air and asked to be directed to the nearest coffee and dining rooms. Mr. Les directed him to a house in the Mile End Road and the stranger quietly left the house followed by Mr. Lusk who went to the coffee house indicated and found the man had not been there but had given his pursuer the slip by disappearing up a court. Two days later, Lusk received another letter with similar writing to the Dear Boss letter. This would be the first letter he received. Write you a letter in black ink, as I have no more of the right stuff. I think you are all asleep in Scotland Yard with their bloodhounds, as I will show you tomorrow night, Saturday. I am going to do a double event, but not in Whitechapel. Got rather too warm there, had to shift. No more till you hear me again, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper is one of the most renowned serial killers st still to this day. Many of these suspects we discuss do check some boxes, such as insanity, criminal records, medical knowledge. However, the true identity of Jack the Ripper is not so clear cut. The letters written are in question if they are written by the killer himself. Could he have an accomplice? Well, yeah, of course. As many famous killers do. <clears throat> but thank you for listening to another episode of Murders, Mysteries, and more. Remember to always keep your eyes open, because you never know where Jack the Ripper is. He's probably dead at this point. Stay tuned in for part four next week.